you could spend a moment with some remarkable people and discover what the life sounds like, what would you ask? Welcome to Our Way on Air, an audio encounter. I'm Armand Nafei, and each episode will feature one conversation with an inspiring friend of mine who will share with us the soundtrack to their life. Greetings from beautiful and sunny Los Angeles and welcome back to another episode of Are We On Air? This week's episode was recorded last October during Paris Fashion Week in my hotel lobby with the wonderful and talented and beautiful DJ and producer that is Nina Kravitz. Nina and I are very dear friends and we spent a long and intense fashion week together where by the end of it we finally had some time to sit down on a Sunday evening in the lobby with no one around us and we were just exhausted lying on the sofa having tea and a glass of wine and just chatted along to for a good four four and a half hours <laughs> so this is like a slightly shortened version but I hope you definitely enjoy it as we chatted about a lot of great things from her beginnings in Russia and our love for Russian music to Duchamp and of course to the late and beautiful and wonderful and talented Sophie and Virgil Abloh we talked about Nina's latest tracks that she just started to release in anticipation for her upcoming album and of course her life as a headlining DJ and what it's like and her process and her creative process. I think this was a beautiful conversation to, that gives you a lot of insight and hopefully show you another side of Nina, a very deep and thoughtful Nina. Yeah, I mean I certainly had a lot of fun. I hope she did too. <laughs> in case that you don't follow us already on Instagram, you should. It's instagram.com slash are we on air and of course our wonderful playlists that are available on our Spotify channel and on Apple. Well, I guess let's get to it as we have a good two hours ahead of us with lots of great stories, music and good vibes. Enjoy! So welcome Nina to Are We On Air. Are We On Air? Are We On Air? We are, on, are We On Air? We are on air. We've been trying to do this interview for now at least a year and a half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm, I always thought, or usually that's how people see me, someone who's, you, you can't catch, I'm always on the go, running around left, right here. But you, me lady, I can't get a hold of you at all. It's like catching a... A, a, a fish like <laughs> flubbery through my hands. Figaro. So like Figaro Tom. Figaro Tom. So finally, it's. But finally, we are here in Paris. Finally, we're here in Paris, which is beautiful. It's Fashion Week. We're sitting in the lobby of Hotel Regina, a beautiful little hotel. And this hotel. And we have the lobby to ourselves. It's just outstandingly beautiful. Only the best for you. It has a very nice floor, original one, has a very nice atmosphere. It's just in front of Louvre, Le Louvre, and I'm having a great time seeing my friend in Paris. Yes. How's your, how was your fashion week, Herman? <laughs> 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 we just talked about it. So far, yeah, so far it's been great. I mean, I'm here because we do, did our first Are and Air collaboration with Maison Valentino. Mm -hmm. So we did a couple of interviews. We curated the music or I curated the music mm -hmm. before and after the show. And they took over some stores and, and cafes and a town square. So that's been super exciting. And, we, um, you know, I'm just preparing for season three, which you are part of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, another great excuse to be in Paris with you, honey bunny. And uh, we had a fun, one of many fun nights the other night where oh, I yeah. lost everything, including yes. my dignity and, <laughs> <laughs> no. and my laptop and my camera and my headphones and my USB. Yes, just a little inside. Arman has been chaotic lately. No, I have not. What? <laughs> what do you mean? First of all, lately, it's been always like this. <laughs> okay. No, but it's yeah. like that, that... That night, we had fun. That was after our little Are We On Air. We had a little Are We On Air soiree at Hotel Grand Amour. 
where <laughs> we had Fiona Zanetti play and I was playing and you were supposed to play and Luca and unfortunately we had a shitty sound system so we dealt with that yes it was interesting <laughs> but we had a cool crowd and a good vibe so that's the most important <laughs> I just came and I, 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 I took immediately you know I'm an audiophile yeah. I perceive the world with with my ears I hear the world that's, you know that's the first thing that actually is being connected is the sound. <laughs> so imagine I'm entering this beautifully decorated bar. I see you and I'm very excited. And then, then I step hear. like two meters. <laughs> and then I hear like... You know, it's I like, mean, it was like in a horror a movie, horrible. actually. Everything yep. we were trying to do to fix. They basically, they have sound issues with the neighbors. So they have limiters on everything. I mean, it just sounded so flat and horrible and tinny and whatever. It's fine. People are still fun, cool crowds, fun times. We had a little soiree, a couple of cocktails, happy yes. days. And then you lost your bag. And then I lost my bag. <laughs> anyway. With the laptop, with my your laptop, with all the collection music. of music, music, with your camera. My camera, which we took some amazing images of the whole week, of our collaboration with Valentino, of us, which was going on how we on our Instagram, but that's gone with the wind. So just imagine, guys. We do, you think, do you think there is a philosophical meaning of it all? Yes, because I've been cutting off everything, every attachment in the past year and a half I cut off because I'm just floating right now and just want to seize the opportunities and the moments and just be in the now. So for me, I was talking about this to a friend of mine yesterday. No matter how upsetting it is, you know, in the end of the day, just, these are just materialistic things that I've already been detaching from, from my house to my car to all kinds of things. And it's so freeing, creative, creatively, but also mentally. And um, now that I'm just like in the building, creating phase, especially with Aria Air, it's uh, very, very freeing. And also, one thing I realized, how much shit we have subconsciously. It's like in the back of our heads on our laptops. Like there's stuff from like years ago. Some of the playlists from years ago that actually don't mean anything to me anymore. So I'm like, you know what? It's okay that those things are gone. So do you, do you, do you think you purged your soul? Big time. I'm still upset about it right now. But eventually with a new laptop in my hand and new camera, I'll move on. And it's okay. And I'm actually kind of okay with starting a fresh, clean laptop slash chapter in my life because it's kind of exciting it's like a blank canvas to draw on again so that's definitely exciting especially now entering season three with the incredible Nina Kravitz and um, talking about painting and canvases I'd like to paint a picture of your life but through a couple of songs I just want to say that today the whole Instagram went down and how exciting Facebook what's, and I was just thinking and what if it just never come back come back how, how is it going to be? Isn't it interesting how I immediately thought, wow, I'm connected to most of the people through WhatsApp and Instagram. But yeah, I'm also experiencing some kind of moment like that. I can tell. You're living your life right now. I'm so happy for you. It's your first Paris Fashion Week as really indulging. And I love how every brand and every person wants you to come to the event, come sit front row, or come do a fitting, come take a picture, come play for us. I'm like, I'm so happy for you. It's like your dream come true <laughs> and vice versa. And it's super interesting how, how the fashion world is really embracing, not just music, they always have in a way, but also like dance music and techno that you are so known and wanted even outside the music world, right? I think that's, that's quite cool. quite flattering, yes. Yeah, yeah I can tell. <laughs> but I, I don't really think about it. I'm just, You're just living enjoying. It. I really, I'm enjoying it, and it's, it's great. It's some kind of a bubble. It is. I'm going straight to it. So basically, I'm, I'm creating like a timeline of your life with the earliest, middle, and the end. And we start with what's your earliest significant musical memory that shaped you as an artist. I think there is not a single moment that could be enough to shape a person as an artist. I think it's um, mostly many, many moments in, in, in a time that are being connected to the current moment of a person's life. And I think if you sum it up all together, then in a perspective of 10, 15, 20 years, you could say, yeah, this this is what actually shaped me as an artist. But I think I'm not at the age of this memoirs yet, <laughs> luckily. So I didn't really think about it. But was it like a, like a moment in your childhood or teen where 
you heard a song or an artist where you thought, I want to be in music or I want to be like this or because, you know, you obviously didn't start in music, but something that just inspired you so much and kind of want to dig deeper. This is very difficult to answer because all my life I've been listening to the music at home. Like my home was filled with music. My father is uh, a musical lover. My mom is a musical lover. They both play piano. They have musical education. And I just remember my childhood as something deeply connected with music. Be it just a, an evening at home with parents or summer vacation near the lake, Baikal, where we, we, we used to spend most of our summer time and leave like there for months, actually for all three months, just leaving what were you, by, were you by the lake. To, hmm? What were your parents listening to then? <clears throat> Give me the Soviet tracks. So my parents uh, and I, we would listen to Led Zeppelin and I think that would be one of my first memories Immigrant song. to enjoy the time where I would be a little bit feverish sick or there would be another reason why I could just stay at home and not go to school and <laughs> listen to Let's Happen with my parents. It's so nice. <laughs> and I would, I, I did like a little performance. Um, I, think I was, you know, doing something with my head. So this kind of circular movements with hair and singing immigrant song. And like basically Robert Plant, I would say, was like a symbol of my very, very young years. Don't baby one more time. Don't make me sit all alone and cry when it's over. I know it, but I can't let go. I'm like a fish out of water and I can't even drink. You don't even wanna talk to me when it's over. Then it would be Gershwin, or Jean Bass. I think I could remember singing it pretty late, pretty early again, when I was just maybe five, six years old. Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong. Got my girl, got my song, got heaven hold the law. Got my girl, got my love. Yes, got my song. Oh, I got plenty of nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got the sun. Got the moon, got the deep blue sea. The folks with plenty of plenty got to pray all the day. Seems with plenty you sure got to worry how to keep the devil away. Away. I ain't afraid of my 
about hell till the time arrives. Never worry long as I'm well. Never want to strive to be good, to be bad. What the hell? I am glad I'm alive. Oh, I got plenty of nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got my then Fleetwood Mac. You can go your own way. It was mostly, mostly um, foreign, foreign music. And there was some also Russian music, but mostly... Don't give me the Russian yet. We'll go to that. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there would be some fusion jazz rock, like Chicago in, in their jazz rock years. Blood, sweat and tears. You got no money and you, you got no home. Spinning a wheel all alone. Talking about your troubles. Weather reports. Pink Floyd. Remember when you were young? <laughs> you shone like the sun. Oh, creme la, de la creme. Creme de la creme. The, of the great pop and rock music and jazz. So many references going on and on. But before you keep going on and on, because we have so many questions about music, I know it's very difficult, but how would you describe yourself with three songs? Who is Nina Kravitz in three songs? First of all, I think there are every, every day there's a new Nina Kravitz. Or maybe even every, every minute. <laughs> There's, there's like this locus. She every, too much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just everything is changing all the time. But that's the beauty also of music and the soundtrack that follows us. It adapts and changes as we change and go along through life. It's never like still. So yeah, it's hard to define in three songs. It's nearly impossible, especially with people like us who are surrounded with music nonstop. But maybe it's just three shades of music that you wanna. I mean, obviously. There's the, the, the dance and night uh, techno, but maybe there are two other things that define... I think to define myself or with three songs would be uh, quite diminishing. <laughs> I, 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 Diminish yourself. <laughs> yes. How is it? How, I really like one sentence from one of the songs that I recently listened. Wait a minute. What is this? I think it's a Sophie song, actually. Yeah. That reduce me to nothingness or something like that. Yeah, reduce me to nothingness. You, you work with Sophie, right? Well, we we did work on some music. I wouldn't say we worked, no, we'd never really worked together, but we knew each other and I was very happy to actually be with her in the studio a few times and we recorded something. But I'm not sure this is a finished version and I actually don't really know what to do with that. But yeah, I think it's a really cool song. So I was singing and we were in the studio. I think in New York we started and then we continued in Miami. It was, I think in 2019, when we were supposed to play in the same party with Grimes 
in Miami. It's an interesting lineup. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to, the idea was we wanted to create something that we could perform all together, but kind of didn't really work because everyone was busy. I mean, you guys have each th the three of you have such a significant strong sound. I mean, yes, I, but I, I, th that I thought that that was my idea, and I thought that would have been really interesting to actually record something and to um, put all those different layers together and in any case we have created something for that and we actually kind of performed it because at the end of at the very end of my set she came and while I was playing the song freshly made freshly rendered from the computer and I was literally editing the vocals on my laptop there at the party backstage wow and it was super fresh yeah. I loved the experience yeah. I was super tired <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, and I played it, and she came, and I have, I think, a little video. It was so good, so good, it, and it feels as if it was just yesterday. Kind of was 2019. Yes. Can we listen to that track? 30 seconds of it. Um, I will think about it. Think about it. <laughs> there are also the, the the thing is that there are a few versions of it. There is. The, the, like very Sophie version <laughs> <laughs> and the there's a version and the very Grimes version <laughs> no 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 Grimes did, completely had nothing to do with that okay. because she did not participate in, in this but and there's also like a low-key Nina version low-key Nina version um, yes a bit more stripped down and um, yeah but I, I actually like a lot Sophie Sophie very Sophie version. Very <laughs> like with all this burbling sounds. <laughs> like what I really love her for. Yeah. <clears throat> I still I still I I still cannot really use past yeah. tense when I'm when I speak to her. It just doesn't feel like it's still it's, it's weird. It's, mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, before we get upset here, second track that defines Nina Kravitz. Oh, was it? Do you, was it the first one? That was the first one. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I, I, it was, I was only. <laughs> that was just an anecdote. <laughs> no, no that, that was just a reference okay. to one of the songs where, uh, where I was trying to remember the line. What, what was that? Not, not reduce me to nothing. I think it's reduce me to nothing, nothingness. She, she would check this out actually. I have no one that. <laughs> I have a phone and Check actually phone. I have such a such a great thing called Spotify. Reduce me to nothing. Oh, that's, I think it's what is that? Imat no, it's not a material. Okay. Playboy fast shop and it's called in the world. Uh, not a cape. Is it called in the water? No, it's not this one. Fast shopping infatuation. Pretending material, whole new world. Maybe this one. Oh wait a minute! Or oh, maybe it was maybe this was face shopping actually. My face is the real shop front. One second. Whole new world. My face is the front of shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So good. Reduce me to nothing else. So good, this moment is so good. Oh, you know what? I wish I had actually my headphones with me, so when we finish the interview, I could actually come back home and play this in my headphones very loud. I love it. I love my favorite thing is to walk around the city alone with my headphones, big one, big headphones, and just like walk and, and walk hours. Paris. 
I love working in Paris, in Moscow, in New York. I always walk a lot alone. It's one of my favorite things to do. So good, so good. And I dream, I, I, I just, I convert my, my whole experience into something else when I walk and listen to the music or just, just walk without listening to the music. Just think about something, just watch what's happening. During this fashion week, I, I was just in the car all the time and I felt like how stressful this whole made me because I didn't have my favorite walking part. I actually don't have a car. I don't use any cars. I used to, to have a driving license, but I lost it. Uh, driving? N- not, not, not an actual license. Oh, okay. I think I'm still pretty much um, allowed to drive, but I didn't renew it. I lost it. And I, I thought maybe it's... It's just, a, it's okay like that for for the moment. Also, you live in cities where you don't really need a car. Yeah, exactly. That time when it ha- when I lost it, um, I still I still lived in Moscow and I still owned a very fast car. What was it? I don't know what Nina was driving. And unlike French Riviera, <laughs> <laughs> I, I could actually drive it. I could drive it and I was driving really fast. Even without being... Even without the license, exp- I was driving very fast. No, no, no. I, no, no, no. I always... I, I had a license. I just... I felt like maybe I could have driven a little less fast <laughs> with such a little experience that I had. So... We're talking about fast and speed. Looking at your career, it's funny. Like, I was... When I, when I talk about you or your sound, how it's changed from, like, Ghetto Kravitz to your latest track now, Skyscrapers. It's it's like for me it's like kind of closing a little cycle where looking at where we are now in twenty what year were we in twenty twenty one on? Ghetto Kravitz came out in what, two thousand nine, ten? Before that. I uh, the song came out in 2011 as a single and then it was also included in the forthcoming album my debut album which was released in 2012 <laughs> sexy I think a huge success also with Gator Kravitz and then you went your sound got harder and harder over time and my theory is and I, I always wanted to ask you this besides your personal interest of course in the sound you were going to but was it also a reaction to the media and all the comments and stuff oh a sexy girl that's why she got rose to fame you know and Gator Kravitz was super sensual and sexy Mm-mm. actually you know the, the very first DJ gig I ever played as a DJ was, I mean, the first DJ gig with an actual crowd, because before that I've been focused on soundtrack music from 70s, 60s. I was playing in bars, restaurants. I also, I was in the band, I was singing, I was a front singer in the band. But my very first contact with electronic music has happened uh, through the radio. That was a pretty tough Chicago acid track by Armando that I heard on the night show on the radio. Which radio station? Where? In, in, in I Moscow? was in Irkutsk, still living in Siberia. And it was something like three o'clock in the morning because the show was from 10 to 12 Moscow time and there's five hours difference in between Moscow and Irkutsk. So, and I would record all the shows on my cassette. So, that means the show was in Irkutsk from airing from 3 to 5 a.m. 
So somewhere in between 3 to 5 a.m. Siberian time, I have discovered electronic music. My first point of contact was that. What year was that? I can't remember. Now, thinking about it, I think the very first point of contact with electronic music actually happened much earlier. And that was, of course, through Alan Parsons' work on Dark Side of the Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. I think that was like a proto-acid EMS Sinti sound on the run. You remember that? That, that sound like whoa, 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 as if... Is that as, sound? As if, How did they create that sound? I actually, you can actually watch this on YouTube. But now, but back then, you can actually watch this. You know, I'll, I'll tell you later. So there's a video. There's an actual video that you can still find it on YouTube, uh, where he's playing EMS CT and actually recreating that sound. <laughs> and I always thought that was some kind of a helicopter. I would imagine the helicopter, maybe some airstrike or something like that. Terrible, some terrible moment and people screaming and all that kind of stuff. It, was, it always gave me a little chills when I was, was, when I was a kid. That sound, it's like when the helicopter is actually really mm, close to the ground and you're sitting or standing still and this huge metal thing is flying over above your head like, and all those little oh yes I think that's basically the very first contact. And talking about Array, I used that in my Array podcast around that time, around the, the release of my debut album, because I wanted to put together all the references for electronic music in that mix. A little bit of Chicago House, a little bit of mm, rock, proto-acid, proto-electronic music, a little bit of techno from Europe and Detroit. And I really like this mix, a little bit of the kinky moment, starting with the very uh, first couple of minutes with a cappella about shaved clams. <laughs> oh, this is shaved clams part two. <laughs> ah, Paris, <Everett. laughs> it's so good. Yeah, you you can re-listen to it. I like it. So it's very it's very slow um, compared to how how fast is the music that I'm playing today, most of the time. So there's always a counterpoint in everything I do, and it's always been like that. There's and the counterpoint is not single. There are many counterpoints. It also happens the same way in, in, in the method of me selecting music, communicating with people, living my life. Everything always has some kind of a counterpoint. And talking about my early days in music, it's also following this simple concept in a way. Because... As a, as a musician, as a producer, when I was making music, my early music, that was all most of the time song song structured with with vocals, with lyrics. Sometimes it would be a little techno orientated, but not too much. But as a DJ, I never really liked to play my music out that much. As a DJ, I wanted to play something much more rough and. Why is that? I don't, just because this is how I function. 
this is some so how my create creative process works. I need I need a protest. I need I need to kind of not a protest, but I need to yeah I need this counterpoint to exist. I think to leave because but, but if don't I don't you wanna, like in a way promote your sound or what your creation like you have an audience in front of you or is that not the audience that you actually want to show that because or maybe it's not the right moment to show it to them do you want the people to listen to your sound or your creation in walking down the sand listen to the headphones no this is not uh, how i'm thinking i just sometimes you know i never prepare my sets and i wish i could just play my music in the set and that would be really good for promotion really but, go to the set now, <laughs> Let's but sometimes I just don't feel like it fits no, yeah, it, no it's course. just yeah. different it's yeah. a different Nina answering your question from a distance it was such a long intro I've started with a very rough music actually as a DJ the first very first set that I played in the actual club apart from my work um for clubs, galleries, restaurants that I've been curating um, and where I play disco, soundtrack music, like early electronica. I've been always connected with acid and techno. So once I was, I got invited to play on vinyl records, a techno set, many, many years ago. It was a very small club. In Russia? In Russia. Called Trish. Trish, that's a cool Trish. name, Trish. Like Patricia, you know, Trish. So, and I remember it's, it was such a cute place and on the walls you had all these manga pictures. It's very sexual in a way. And the, the room where I played was really, really tiny. There were maybe 50 people. They all knew that I was supposed to play and I brought some records with me. One was, I think, from Exos on Icelandic label, Tule, I think. tell you why I remember uh, on missile I think and then the third one what was the third one it was either surge you know something like some European techno this I can't remember anymore but it was really tough because I was craving for that kind of sound I loved it so much always since the very very beginning <clears throat> that actually what got me hooked to that sound and that moment that feeling I have I have carried with me till now and it's been as fresh as ever so nothing changes with that which is incredible in fact there's a resurrection of that sound mm. Mm. well for me it wasn't a resurrection because it, never it was there with you but I think in the general, the general sound that we hear today I think that's a huge resurrection of that sound. okay that's a good way of looking at it I, I didn't have very 
much experience with mixing those records. I was okay and I kind of learned already how to manage disco type of mixing, you know, when you just cut the tracks and you know exactly where you want to do it and start a new record. So I got used to that <clears throat> and I knew more or less how to present the music. Whereas with techno, I didn't have that experience at all. And even though I already had a mixer and turntables at home, the experience was very, very little. So that what was obvious in those 15 minutes that I have. <laughs> You well, we gotta start somewhere. <laughs> I mean, this this was one of the most memorable moments in my life because I was so excited to play, and I I didn't even bother to build something, and I just wanted to start <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right away. I just, I just wanted to show and how great this uh, sound. And it was quite fast and was heavy and I didn't manage to mix those three records very well. But what I did manage quite... It was literally uh, just 15 minutes. Yes, because uh, after the second record... <laughs> <laughs> I remember that everybody laughed. <laughs> and the third mix was kind of private experience because... <laughs> There's only one person who was I with me. I, you know, it's, listen, it was no, but I, you know what is so interesting? I was just with a smile on my face all the time. I, it didn't bother me at all. I was so into that. I was so happy yeah. about that that I could actually play it on a loud sound system. And that friend, I know that friend, I remember him very well. He was standing there smiling, like, <laughs> and he, I think he saw it, you know. I, now thinking about it, like kind of scrolling back to that time, I think he saw it. How excited I was about that, and how little, how didn't care. I was, was bothered that, <laughs> that everybody left. Uh, and, I, and, and then I think I was so in the moment, uh, so absorbed yeah. in, in this process of actually, me, let's call it a mixing. But anyway, <laughs> what kind of mixing? In, out. In, no, no, no. I was mixing. Okay. Unfortunately, actually, if I did it in and <laughs> out, it would in, have yeah. been really good. But. I actually did mix the records and that was very um, disturbing, obviously, but not for me. For me, it was very interesting and exciting. So, and then I, 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 I realized that everybody left and he just stayed there and I just finished the third mix, was done already in between me and him. And then I finished because there was nobody to, to play the music for. And... <laughs> <laughs> and because there were two rooms yeah. and one Every this one yeah room. everybody <laughs> went to the other and you know what that moment yeah. I also remember it pretty clearly I said to myself this is a promise this is going to be the first and the very last time where I actually clear the dance floor oh nice you promised yourself or with your friend to myself and since that moment I have never cleared the dance floor again no matter what happened. Well, it actually kind of happened in 2019 oh. at Coachella. Really? But <laughs> yes. Really? No. Why? <laughs> well, you were playing at the Yuma tent? Uh, no, I actually did my show. I did this um, um, show. Yeah, I had, I, did, you don't know? I wasn't there. Uh, oh, you you could watch it. There's a... Oh. Uh, there's, uh, on YouTube. Oh, really? Yeah. But you were outside in the stage or in the tent? I was, I was headlining the stage. Oh, yes, the, yeah, I remember uh, the, uh, the lineup, uh, yeah. Mojave, I think, Mojave, stage. Yeah, stage, yeah. And I was closing, I was playing against, kind of, against uh, the huge headliner, uh, Childish Gambino. Oh, shit, yeah. And everybody in was... LA. Mm. Um, it's not like a games, but you know, it's a huge festival. Yeah, it's to also walk. Charles Gambino, especially in 2019 and in New Coachella in California. Yes. Uh, well, so I don't know. It's, it's nice that yeah. you don't know about it. Uh, I did this kind of theatrical performance type of show where I did, uh, I, I've, be, I've been working on it for a long time. We did some pre-film and it, it included some cinematic moment, some tea drinking on stage, banana eating and... <laughs> And some music. I was playing some 
of I, all the music, most of the music was mine. I, I wrote it for, for the show. I was also singing live. And because I did not really... No, it was difficult because my microphone was catching up with all the... I mean, it was catching all the frequencies, all the noise. It was very hard with in-ear monitoring. And I wanted it to be that this way. I wanted it to be as... Artistic. Naturalistic. No, this is the least thing I've, I'm thinking about. I think if an artist thinks how to make his show artistic... Uh, this is already a failure. Pr pretty uh, <laughs> alarming. <laughs> There's something wrong, I guess. Just you and me. Like if you actually, <laughs> now if you're just like thinking how to make your show artistic, this is like, this is a problem, I think. At, at least that would have been for me if I had that kind of question in my mind. No, I, don't, I didn't have time for it because I had an idea and I had a vision what I was going to do. The only thing that was missing is experience because this kind of show you need to rehearse maybe for a year until... But then I said, you know what, I'm not going to re rehearse it because the whole point now? is... No, I, I never really regret anything. <clears throat> it's like with your bag. You know, you don't have to regret. You have to think about it as an opening opportunity, opening that's, a new door. That's the way I look at it. And not to be it's attached to... with free with, yeah. page. Purging the, the, exactly. the life experience. I wanted it to be a little bit spontaneous. Of course, I knew main parts. And also, I played both weekends, pretty much like every artist that is doing Coachella. I After the first weekend, I re retextured the entire show. Was a big difference between first weekend and second? It was, yes. Not, not a big, big difference, but it was a big difference. Also, on the first show, imagine, I was a little nervous. I wasn't when I started because I, I walked and the first 20 minutes it was just kind of ambient music. I was looking in the mirror, feeling myself like at home, <laughs> yeah. sitting on the couch, talking, watch, watching myself in the mirror, drinking tea, just being comfortable and setting the atmosphere. <laughs> and, like, the, yeah. <laughs> and the whole place was packed. So much, so many people, and I loved it. So nice. And then I, then I started um, kind of feeling that the, the tension is fading away, and the other layer, like the other kind of tension, is approaching. Tension in, inside within of you, me, within the audience, with, within uh, me. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I kind of felt a little alienated by the whole experience suddenly. And then there was also a very interesting moment uh, where I performed, I was dancing on the carpet and we had that camera, like, I don't know, just, just so you understand, there was many different cameras and also pre-recorded part, like pre-filmed part that was supposed to recreate and kind of this... Um, was supposed to confuse a little bit people of what is actually happening, what was the part of now and what is the part of that was pre-recorded before. And also like Virgil Abloh, he rented, he was also doing something on the same stage, I think, and he, he was kind enough uh, to let me land his camera from the uh, from upper camera so you could also see that the whole thing from like this red Soviet type of carpet and I was just basically dancing on the, on the nice. red carpet. That's some good footage. And then something cracked in my knee. Ah. And I was just like, ooh, that's painful. <laughs> exactly. And I was just like, I can't say shit in the microphone. <laughs> it's probably... <laughs> what we just did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then, because people are going to hear that and I was just, I just, I started, okay, so what am I going to do? Because I couldn't move my knee and it was really painful. So I moved my knee and I felt even more painful. And I said, okay, so. <laughs> I'm just going to stand still. <laughs> it was a really interesting experience, you know, and I, I was like seeing all these people in front of me being completely confused by the entire thing. They just, they were so, they didn't understand what was happening. I saw like this big question mark in their eyes. <laughs> And then I, I, and then I, I started to notice that um, 
the capacity has been reduced. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. For, and for another 10 or 15 minutes, I was a bit nervous about that. And then I kind of, I realized that this is like, you know, already has happened. And so I was like, okay, fine. Things. And then I relaxed. That was the most brilliant moment. And those, I don't know how many people have actually been... So some people, uh, let's, let's say some people stayed. And I think they had an incredible time because I had an incredible time yeah. and I felt most comfortable. I, I just, I sat it in, on, on the carpet with my microphone. I was singing and I couldn't hear myself in the <clears throat> monitoring because monitoring was really problematic. And also the Wally Badaru was my guest, my dear guest, a special guest. And Who is a special guest? Wally Badaru. And, um, you could hear his work um, on many brilliant albums, for example, on, on um, Night Clubbing by Chris Jones, his beautiful keys he did. But his album as a solo artist was pretty much incredible as well. I've been so flattered to, know, to have been knowing him since uh, Red Bull Music Academy in Australia that I participated at, and that's where we met. Kind of stayed in, in touch a little bit. So I invited him as a special guest, and we performed a song that was kind of my, that was my lyrics, my song, but his music. And we kind of rehearsed a little bit. So what happened is that the there, there was like some kind of a um, underneath pre-recorded part and he was supposed to play keys on top of it so something has happened i don't know what I, i'm still thinking what what was that but basically the tonality was different or what was it was it maybe it was something with this with the speed with the playback i don't know what happened but i tuned my voice to the wrong tone that I heard in my in my um, in, the ass. <laughs> in mm. my ears so it was so interesting then I when I heard the recording I was like oh my god this is like oh I, I remember <laughs> you know sometimes in the spring this is the sound you hear from the yards of the backyard where a bunch of cats are <laughs> mating <laughs> so you know it's just like <laughs> <laughs> is that why you, know, you, you, for your new record, took uh, singing lessons to improve your singing? The thing is, the thing is, it's not really about improving my singing. It's just like one time, one thing is when you sing in the studio and live singing is a completely, completely different, different experience. Yeah. Also, when I used to tour as a, as a singer in the band, back in the days with a band, I had a band. Yeah. What was the band called? MySpace Rocket. MySpace Rocket? MySpace Rocket. MySpace? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so when we were singing, I had always monitor. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any. Are there recordings of this band? Yes. Okay. There's even the record released Ooh. in 2007. Okay. Which is your favorite record? Track from that record? <clears throat> it's only one track. <laughs> okay. It's, <an> <laughs> it's called okay. Amok. Yes. It's, it's on, it was released on Greg Wilson's label. Oh, nice.
but we had the whole, the whole album actually ready um, many songs and I, I unfortunately I had to leave them all because we had a conflict fortunately for all of us you had to leave you think so yeah because we have you now true so <laughs> so basically yes I did some singing classes but my point was that it's not like I could <laughs> I have a perfect ear like I could hear the notes everything it's like a natural thing I don't have a problem with that but I think to be able to perform on stage on such a huge stage also when, once you use in-ear monitoring you're isolated it's not when you actually what use, do you listen to in that moment you just hear directly you what? listen to okay you listen to your voice mm. it must be so weird but it is weird and isolating and also you hear everything that's happening in the rooms so it's very very interesting mm. and kind of unpleasant uh, part of this it takes time to get used to it and practice exactly with. and I didn't have that time so it was very fresh so it was just a mistake of to, like hearing the wrong uh, sound it was so strange and that was basically the problem but you know it's It is what it is. It was a funny experience. And it's your bag moment. It's fine. It's part of your what life. What kind of? Your bag. Like my bag. Yeah. It's, a, it's part of life? No, yes. I don't see it as, as this. I, I love it. I mean, this no, has been interesting. It's part, of, part of the life experience. We learn. No, it's not a bag moment. Bag. Not no, bad. it's not a bag moment. Oh. <laughs> okay. Totally not a bag moment. Bag, a bag moment. Uh, no. With a G, not a D. For, for for those people who can, who get confused already with all this interesting story, <laughs> Armon has lost his bag. Oh, <laughs> And he doesn't even remember. He, he doesn't story. even remember where, where that happened. Bye. Because this, <laughs> this was happened. But I have to say, I left. I left when that happened. Okay, so he, he went to, to the bathroom. I'm alone. Lay, lying on, in, on the couch <clears throat> this beautiful room yeah but we decided Armin and myself we decided that this was an okay experience that's okay Listen, that he lost his bag and we decided we have chosen to look at it as an opportunity as a purging moment For him, so now he has coined that moment again <clears throat> to express similarity with my Coachella experience. But I disagree with that. This is a completely different moment. I really enjoyed it, and I do not regret anything. That's been actually quite a turning moment for me. Also, it feels really interesting now because I'm alone speaking. <laughs> to myself and there is this traffic light there's a red light that I see through the window <laughs> and I'm speaking to you all without even knowing who are you <laughs> and who's going to listen that fashion week has been really interesting flattering <laughs> with a lot of pleasure but also very exhausting isn't it strange to see that someone is talking on the, in the microphone alone <laughs> in the room I love it so the question was I was so basically I always liked rough music always and I couldn't play I didn't like to play my own songs because I thought my own songs is a part of a different experience it's a different context different different me and I, when I'm in the studio I'm this when I'm a DJ I'm something else and there's only a few songs that I enjoyed playing Don't get me wrong. It's not because not, not that it, I didn't like it, them. I love the songs. Yeah, I just didn't. I didn't feel like I would like. I wanted to perform them uh, as modigliously because in it's a, a very different, different music. Sound, yeah. And I always. But don't you think, as, a, as a, when you have a nothing. successful track, that people are exp like they come and they kind of expect? Exactly. That's that was always a problem because they would when always want. Play to, when you yeah, but play well, I played. I always played in Italy as a very last song, and it's always like a 
freaking out. So everyone's freaking out. It's <laughs> one of the best moments ever. Yeah, to see I how mean, many people actually know. Yeah. And you know what is interesting? I played this in Moscow. Really? Yeah, I played it in Ghetto Crowds in Moscow. Thank you. The and you also Cup. did it. it, it was and so now I'm Russian trail. So we so had cool. track. So, you know, it's just... Uh, um, it's always flat, quite flattering to see how many people know it. And also, you know, every three years the audience is changing, uh, especially in my world. Like three, because basically until you're 24, you're, you're going to clubs, you're, you have your nightlife, but then you either get married or you become a little bit more mature or you just Unlike get a us. job. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you, just, you, you, you don't. You either don't go out that much, yeah. or you just do it extremely rare. And then, you, yeah. So basically, we're we're talking about something like the, the time in between eighteen and twenty three, twenty five, yeah. max. So every three years, there are new, whole new audience, audience more or less. Yeah, but they all know the song in Italy. Yeah. How great! But it's funny. Like when I asked, when I had this conversation with. Um, Paul Kalkbrenner, who you also know, he's also known for Sky and Sand, right? Like the Berlin Calling soundtrack. But, but um, I asked him, was like, what, is that what everybody now wants to hear all the time? It's like, you know what? No one has asked me in years that because he produced new stuff and released it and the audience changes as well. So the, as you said, people grow up and also there's a new audience that also get used to the sound that you're creating now. So do you think people now in their 18 to 24, they know you for skyscrapers now? And they expect you to play skyscrapers? Some people do expect me to do so. And I hope there will be new people as well that will be knowing <laughs> me for my new music. But again, I don't think about it. Let's see. I'm just, uh, I have to do my thing. Do your thing. I, I also can see. already tell, I mean, you, you sent me over the summer some of your new demos from the new album, which I mm -hmm. think is coming out this year. Not this year. Not this year, next, next year. year. And I think they're pretty amazing. Thank they you. Actually, Means I told you, no, I was in, 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 in a COVID quarantine in Ibiza by myself for mm -hmm. three weeks. Mm -hmm. And when you send them, they gave me so much energy. Not that they were like dancey, crazy, but they were like, they're three different moods, the tracks at least that you sent me. And it's just the time where you also dropped skyscrapers. So and I nice. love them. That was super nice. But I was sitting also, on the rooftop of my mm -hmm. little house in Ibiza by myself for three weeks to listen to those tracks. It like, gave me different moods. Um, so what nice. kind of... Which I, I thought also going back to your like singing and maybe to more like get a cravat sound, less trip acid. What kind of during the lockdown inspired you to... What... what got you to this sound again, to this warmer, mm. I can listen to this in my headphones walking down the sand if I wanted to by myself. I think it's just just, just a cycle and the, the phase. I think the phase has started around 2018, ah. actually. I think... Ah. So I it's have, not a lockdown. Mm -mm. I have already started making, again, songs, lots of songs. To be honest with you, I have never really stopped doing that. I was just basically writing them mostly, and I never really finished. But you any have the time because you're touring the whole time. Not, not really. I was just really focused on my DJ path. I, I, you know, after I released my album in 2012, that I was did the a, last time. Yes, yeah. it was only one. Yeah. Uh, I released music afterwards, but yeah. only EPs, LP, LP was only one called Nina Kravitz, eponymous album. So... Do you have a title for the new album? I... Uh, no, not yet. Uh, it's, I think I'm waiting until it's, it, it will Name just... Name comes uh, always at the end for really? anything. Yeah. That's one thing I learned from Andre Balas. Like when I was trying to find a name for our little private club at the Chateau, he's like, don't worry about it. It will come to us at the final end. And mm -hmm. he was right. Okay. Yeah, so name always comes at the end. Let's see. Mm, what I was saying. Oh God, I'm so Victoria tired. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. This yeah. is, it gives a very interesting shade. 
So Nina has been basically out for the past week, day and night, to 20 million shows, parties, <laughs> soirees, <laughs> shootings, uh, dressing, meetings. <laughs> I've never seen someone indulge in fashion week so much as you have. <laughs> I mean, I've been around for 20 years doing this, a little bit here and there, but you just went in and like I immersed, immersed in this experience. Like, Give it to me, baby. <laughs> yes, so Can't good. Can't believe you're actually here. <laughs> yeah. Mean, yeah. Also, we have this beautiful lobby to ourselves. How Magical and beautiful is that. I love that. We're literally lying on a sofa. Could you please pour that. me some water? Yes, my darling. I, I've, oh, I've, I've never stopped making music and writing songs, but I just never really had an urge to finish them. And when I released my debut album, I did some shows because I thought, okay, now I need to do live shows. Apart from being DJ. Now Why? That, Why do would you? Because, I, like I told you, I didn't see how I can play my music, perform my music uh, in the DJ set because it was so different. Yeah. Sometimes it would be um, suitable for the DJ set. For some songs of mine, of course, I suitable like Pain in the Air, so Show Me Your Time or Get Kravitz or uh, some other. But others were slightly more melodic, more song-orientated, more listening, I would say. And it was just overly... Mild. It was too mild for for this it's for the set. Something sexy. It is warm. Mm, yeah, but it was just not the sound I wanted to play as a DJ. Club, yeah. I, I never really had. I also I, I had that face. I used to play disco, Italo disco. I've never Roma. seen you play that. Oh, it's, I actually I've been playing. I've been so absorbed by this era. Recently? Not recently, no, no, I mean but like playing it. Well, like I've been I've been into it maybe for. Three four years oh, and playing like disco play Italo, like Italo, Italo, I love Italo, Italo, Italo. Uh, and like favorite. electro, electro disco, this kind of music. So yes, I and basically I did a couple of um, live shows in 2013. One was at Sonar Festival, the other one was in Milan, and. I just realized it didn't really. I, I realized that I don't have any interest of doing that. I was not ready to continue, and I, it was clear, very clear, that I want to be a DJ at the moment. Didn't have any interest in performing my music live. And after a few kind of sketchy performances, I realized that that's. I'll just put it aside for now. Mm. And that was it. And I focused on being a DJ, running a record label. This is what I really wanted to do. And up until 2000, maybe 18, a couple of years, it was okay. But then I, I felt like it's coming back. I, I wanted to, because you know, also, I guess it's because I focused so much on that. I really integrated in, in this record digging. Of course, it was good because if not that, I wouldn't be who I am today. And of course, a DJ needs not only experience but also knowledge. And it's, just, it's like an everyday work, searching for new music, getting inspired, and searching for new artists, like spending time at record stores. What I'm trying to say is that okay, the the music that you're digging, you're searching, is exciting for you. It's exciting for you as a door to some to I, s somewhere where I, you I feel agree. comfortable and no. you you feel um, you feel connected to that kind of atmosphere and you all you need to do is to create the atmosphere. Yeah. So you're talking to Monsieur Director d'Ambiance first of all. Atmosphere is my life, okay? Mm -hmm. And as one thing a friend of mine said to me once. Because I asked him, because, you know, I have this playlist called Studio Noi Monthly, where I just drop everything I find here, Shazam, record, I put it in on a monthly basis, just share it with the world. And, and in the beginning, when I, before I did this, I asked a friend of mine, I was like, is it okay if I just basically give away and open whatever I find and give it to the public? And he's like, you can give it away because no one will ever be able to play it the way you play it. Absolutely. And I think that, that was such a key moment. I was like, yeah, you would play, I give you 10 tracks, you and I would play those 10 tracks differently 
it's also in a different venue, different energy, the way we put it together, the way we play what, and also our energy behind it, the way we animate the audience. Moreover, mm. and even you wouldn't be able to play it like you. This is something that we cannot control, but we can only operate with. I think reactions is, is a co co con consequence of the interaction with the track. Mm. But what comes first, in my personal opinion, is what is there that you have that you can actually transmit with a particular track. Mm. And this is not a mechanical experience of mm. putting two tracks together in the mix. DJing is basically sharing your experience as a human being. It's sharing what you have learned, what you have felt. And this experience is ever-changing, ever-growing, ever... -growing, ever um, maybe improving, self-improving and this is new every time and it, depending on the context the context is everything you can play the most tasteful selection to a certain audience a certain room but if you're not able to create an atmosphere with it If you're not able to find a key to the audience, then this selection means nothing. It's just a selection of great records. But I think a great DJ, a great performer, is somebody who is able to find this connection, who is able to connect. And the moment this connection happens, you're basically sharing your whole self, your, your life experience with other people. And you're creating a new, absolutely new place, in a, a new momentum, a new moment in time that not nobody, even you, will ever be able to repeat again. Oh. I mean, isn't that's that a, amazing? Yeah, isn't that yeah, magic? Yeah, yeah. So when you know, I'm sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's so easy to DJ. What there's like so so much problem around it it's too easy yes but I, I i don't worry because 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 being a dj is being being an artist is is this is and you cannot create an atmosphere when once you don't know the mechanics of it once you don't have the tools and once you don't have experience It all comes with experience. Unless, unless you are super young. And just go for it. Or, or not even young. You can be also not young, but, and, but, <laughs> but, just, but just a beginner in something, like starting this whole thing for the first time. And then you would have all this energy of a beginner that would compensate the lack of experience. And that would clear all the obstacles on the way to connect with the audience. This is also another, another tactic. It's another way of creating the atmosphere. So, and, but, you know, overall, this is, you know, I've been doing it for quite a long time now, and it's still a mystery to me. Hmm. Why is this actually happening? And you know what's funny about that? Because those pockets, those windows are so short. We're talking about like what? One, two, three, four, five, six hours a day, a night, and then multiply, let's say, for a touring DJ, three, four times a week. But these are just fleeting moments that we're chasing. And even those three, four hours, they might be just half an hour, maybe one hour, where it's like the, the perfect chemistry. And we're chasing this, and that's why you say, okay, I've been doing this for so long. Okay, we're talking about like, what, 10, 15, 20 years we've been doing this, and yet we're still chasing, not chasing, but it's that half an hour, that one hour, where it's just like, everything comes together perfectly well. And that feeling, it's just like, it's like an out of body experience. I, I, for me, it's like somebody is just give, some, someone from above is giving you a hand and you're- That's what Prince always used to say. We're just like the bodies. We're just like the basic glass of uh, an empty glass and the divine, or even Gold Shift of Farani in season two of my interviews here. We're like the bamboo. We're like a bamboo. And it, we, we get Armand, filled. you're such a bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I finally have understood. <laughs> I'm a bamboo. You're, you're really, you are a bamboo. <laughs> bamboo. I am a bamboo and we get filled by the divine. 
Okay, I, I have something to add. Do you know what is my favorite moment? Yeah, what moment? Like my favorite moments in what you just described. Okay, of course we all enjoy when it's all perfectly aligned, yeah. when you arrive and everything's great. People are excited to hear you. You just, and in a split second, the atmosphere is there. But sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes you're booked to places that don't you don't work particularly at all. enjoy. Totally. And this is actually my favorite moment where you have this challenge. I managed to, 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 I manage. When I manage and I start to enjoy this so much, when I see you that people prepare, that yeah. were actually not prepared for the experience, I actually is there, they are hooked. And I was able to find the language, you know, their language to be able to continue the conversation. And that's the most enjoyable moments for me in my work. Mm. When you actually find the right key with all the tools that you have in place with your music. And also, I think I've learned it in through my young days when I used to work for we and weddings. How are you fishing for compliments here, darling? And, no, listen, this was very, very useful experience because what I've learned, I, I never, you know what is interesting? No matter what I played as a DJ on weddings, be it a wedding or be it some birthday party or a cafe where people just usually don't give a shit about it's the DJ. background and there's performance. Yes, also but I always yeah. try to make it my performance. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not so, you? Oh, yeah. And I, I, I always had music that I like and I, and I thought, okay, so what would they be potentially enjoying? Probably something cheerful, something happy, something energetic. But why don't I select something that I also like? So I could enjoy it as well. Do you have like go-to tracks for these moments? Like, I always have like a couple of songs where I know they're universally liked. Blue I'm not Monday. Talking, like, so Blue good. Monday is one of those yes. songs that I just feel like it works everywhere. Maybe Yazoo situation. Do I dress for every situation? Moving through the doorway of a nation. Pick me up and check the down. Baby, I can't do without. Don't mess around. You bring me down. How you get about? Don't make sense. Move out. Or any disco song, which would probably be okay. Oh, maybe Herbie Hancock, Rocket. to make this song at mm. the time so I'm Dia dying to get Herbie on the show mm. he's been liking a lot of our and Air stuff but I still really? haven't on the show oh, I'm know. such a huge fan yes. and also I really appreciate how many phases he has yes. in the artist that's a different that's, song that's what's so interesting also like I call it the Madonna thing where you have like every decade or every not decade every season a different face and a different sound face in terms of like the image I, I did, did have you seen that video and also you can probably find it on YouTube where Herbie 
is together with Quincy Jones mm. in the room and they're just jamming and been talking. Love it. Oh, it's, it's one of the most mesmerizing videos. Mm. They're so, so cute and so great. It's Love just like the graceness is flashing, you know, it's just so bright. Ooh, I met Quincy Jones one time. Starstruck. It's like yesterday I met Vivian Westwood for the first time. I, know. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. It's like, oh. it's funny, I was so happy when I saw it. I was so happy for you because you were just talking about what last time we were together in Paris, which was what maybe a month ago. Mm -hmm. And you just talked about the the Vivian Westwood shoes that you bought that Naomi used to wear when she fell. <laughs> yes. And then fast forward a month later you met her and you were I was like, oh no, how much you're like dying right now. Yes. <laughs> So nice. Did you tell him about your shoes? <laughs> no, I didn't. It was a very quick conversation. Yeah. But I just told her that I love her and yeah. that I'm, I'm the most happy person in this whole fashion week. Yeah, you to, are. Just in the most excited one. I, I'm just sure, but I don't, I don't even oh, want to, sure. to enter the competition. No. There's no competition. There's no way around it. I just, just know glowing. it. I love I, it. I've been glowing <laughs> and I, I know that I've, I've been the most excited person about this meeting. And yes. I'm just I have to say, you are, that. I mean, we know each other for a bit now and for a while, but you are very, you're a loyal, loyal person, a loyal friend, and you stick to your word. But to catch you this week, and I didn't, I mean, I was totally, I'm, of course, easy. But I was like, I'm just like, let, just let her have her. Like, of course, you need to go to every fucking little thing that you get invited. Of course, run with it. Yes, but it, still, <laughs> you showed up somehow at somewhere. Of course, of course. I couldn't, I couldn't let trait. you down. Couldn't let you down. Of course yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say I'm quite loyal. Yes. Sometimes what's, what's it doesn't. Sign are you? Oh, that's the private information. Oh, okay. Well, I'm Leo. If anybody's asking. Actually, I think not many people know how, what sign I am. Like, I, I have never seen the right, correct information anywhere about me. Uh, I like it. I'd never really ce celebrate. I don't really celebrate uh, birthdays. But another past, which I loved, our moment in Tokyo together. A little shout out to our friend Rod Manley, who we dearly love. When we played together for mm -hmm. with an incredible lineup for Calvin Klein three mm -hmm. years ago, where it was you, Hito, me, James Murphy, Jamie. And a lot XX. of caviar. A lot of caviar from Iran. And oh. uh, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. we had a little after party in the hotel. I think it was your room with all of us. And you and I. No, were I think it was Rod's room. room. Mm -hmm. And you and I had a little back to back via YouTube. And you were live streaming on your Insta Live. I never got that. I was playing Persian. I was giving you Persian tracks and you were giving me Russian tracks. I said that. Yeah. And I love that moment because I, of course, love world music in general. But also those. Soviet disco tracks you gave me. They are golden. They were gold mines. And I gave you a lot of gugush and so forth. And um, and I, I think I told you this anecdote before. But I, that same summer, I went to play at Sunset Beach, you know, one of the hotels in the Hamptons. And I played, was it Apples in the Snow? <laughs> so I played it. <laughs> And I love that track. And I was playing that and out of nowhere this like group of Russian men and women came. <laughs> and there was these women who were screaming at the husband. They were like going crazy. I'm like, oh my god, how do you know this track? And they were going crazy dancing. And they were screaming at the husband, give him money, give him money. <laughs> 
they wow. were tipping me like twenty dollars, and I'm like, it's fine, guys, it's fine. I love playing this. This is good. It's great to it's, know me, huh? Yeah, no, no. And then, and then they just kept throwing these twenty dollar bills at me, and I turned to my friend, or the GM at the time, Manolo. I was like, Manolo, start fucking collecting the money because it was piling on the DJ booth and falling on this floor, and I was like, I'm playing. I can't stop picking up money now on the floor. So I'm like, Manolo, can't collect that money. They basically. For this playing this one track, they pay like two thousand dollars and twenty dollar bills. They just throw it at me. <laughs> I was like, and I think I texted him. It's like Nina, send me more of these tracks. <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice track. So give me more of those tracks. I need more of these beautiful tracks. It's such I love a it. romantic track it's so beautiful. about it's apples, apples on, the on the snow. And there was another more mellow. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, that's yeah. the, that's the legendary band called Kino Cinema. Mm. Russian yeah. translation, yeah. Viktor Tsoi, and I think it's one of the most signature group, rock rock group, uh, symbolizing golden era in music, in Russian rock music, alternative music. Next to Kuryohin, next to uh, Aquarium. Под небом голубым есть город золотой. С прозрачными воротами и яркою звездой, а в городе том сад, все травы до да цветы, гуляют там животные невиданной красы. Борис Гребенщиков. Я был свидетель рождения девы из Силуэт, возникающий там, а не тут Я говорящий прямо о второстепенном And next to Nautilus Pompilius or any other great rock bands or even Norm, if somebody knows and somebody Russian speaking listen like some alternative music like that It's just, it's been a wonderful time. Leningradsky Rock Club, wow. Whew. One of my favorite bands ever. And there's a song called Pachka Cigarette. And if you only could experience the lyrics in my language, you would be, you would be so amazed. And yeah, смотрю в чужое небо из чужого окна. И не вижу ни одной знакомой звезды. It's just incredible. It's just so simple. Like the lyrics are so simple, but so powerful. He's singing basically. I am watching. Um, how, you, how would I translate "чужое"? Something that is not yours. You are um, not mine. Alien, alien. Alien. Alien, alien. Like not, not mine. Estranio. Espanol is estranio. In, in, in Italian, stranger. Mm. Foreign alien. Yes, alien. Okay. Alien. Strange. So he sings, I watch alien sky from the alien window and do not recognize a single familiar star. It's just, You know, when I translate it, it doesn't sound so powerful, but in Russian, it sounds so good. And actually, this is exactly how I sometimes feel when I travel. So the people know what we're talking about. It sounds kind of nice from, from the microphone.
Yeah, I'm so, so thankful you gave me those tracks. I love them so much. Thank you much. so much. I appreciate that you like. I'm so happy that you connected to that. But also, this is um, the, the the leader of Viktor Tsoi. He's a, a, a Russian, but like of Korean uh, origin, oh. descent, uh, like a Russian Korean, I would say. And he, that's why he has this last name Tsoi. Uh, so, and he also says that in that song. I looked I looked back and I couldn't I couldn't recognize my footsteps anymore after I walked all the different roads and checked all the paths but if I have a pack of cigarette in my pocket that means I'm still going that everything is kind of all right isn't this a really nice song for just to have in mind and that the nice song that you can play in when times are weird or when you're a little down or when you're up and have Russian people in front of you throwing $20 bills <laughs> <laughs> I like how you just killed my whole romantic <laughs> pathos of, of this monologue it's great I like it's something it's, it's, it's refreshing it keeps me it keeps me in check. It keeps me like ready to act for action. Mm. How important is silence and solitude to creativity? 433. Nice. That's how important it is. There is no music without a silence. There is no... Mm. There's only... Do you want to explain what 433 is to our listeners who don't know? That's that's the number. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But that's the, the length. Right? That's the length. And that's the reference And what a to genius idea in the first place. It's very Marcel Duchamp in a way. Absolutely, yes. I used my... Genius. Actually, my first song from Coachella is called Duchamp. Ah. It was just silence? No. It was an uh, ambient song, and I'm just reading some parts from Duchamp book about artistry. Wait a minute. This is what I, this is what I, I can play. It. I, I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm too tired. While she's looking on her phone, before I forget, I'm telling this to myself and to our listeners. What do you usually listen to when you're traveling? Like, there's a lot of, when I ask touring DJs, they usually come along with Aphex Twin ambient works, because that's the music they can, or sound, ambient sound, they can zone out to on planes for hours. But I'm just telling myself while you look in your phone so you can think about it. Oh, uh, I'm supposed to think about... No, but it's just so a reminder to myself. And to go back to that. The, 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 this is the um, the very beginning of the show. And ah. if they give the attribute. Beautiful, beautiful. If we give the attribute. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You have hardly any dislikes, so people liked it. If we give the attribute. About what he's doing or why he's doing it. About what he's doing or why he's doing it. If we give the attributions in the artistic execution of work rest, pure institution. Pure institution and artistic execution of art rest. <laughs> If we give the attribute, 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 beautiful, beautiful. If we give the attribute, attribute, attribute. If we give the attribute, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 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 Beauti
what he is doing or why he is doing it. If we give the attributions in the artistic execution of work rest, pure institution. Just, I just find, found it really interesting how it sounded. I was there with Wally, Wadaru in the studio and he's playing keys, it's his keys. And I just took a, a book of Marcel, Marcel Duchamp and I was reading and I was just like reading it, I was tired. And then I, when I listened to, to a playback, I thought it was kind of nice that I was, the, the way I pronounced this execution of the work rest, and, you know what I mean? Mm. So the, yeah, you, you can watch it later, yeah. but. Are you gonna repeat this performance somewhere? Mm -mm. That's only meant to be okay. performed one time, I exclusively. Created it. I mean, look, I mean, from what you're showing me now, I, I think it was great. Maybe it's too. It was too challenging for the Coachella yeah, absolutely. crowd. Absolutely, that's why nobody could. Yeah. It was 20 minutes. Was like this basically, and they need 30 second instant hits. Those kids in Coachella. I was drinking a lot of tea, and it was like more like theatrical stuff, a little bit, all combined with pre-filmed footage before. So it was pretty kind of punk rock, to be honest. Because when I tell it to my friends, they ask me like, oh, what, 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 yeah, I said, eh, you know, I just want to try something new. They said, yes, Nina, Coachella is exactly the right place. <laughs> yes, that's what I was do. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, for me, I don't understand why not, you know, I just yeah, don't challenge get challenge the kids a little no, bit. I, I didn't, no, I don't know what the challenge, I just didn't see any problem with it. I, well, I Coachella think is, I mean... I thought it's really nice and interesting and... It is yeah. nice and interesting, but I think you also have to choose your target at some point. Like, this was not your target audience. This would have worked if we talk about a big festival. I mean, I'm sure it worked. I'm, not, I'm just saying from what you're telling me. But even at a big festival like Glastonbury would have an audience that is culturally more inclined and tuned to this. I disagree. No. I think artists should be just doing do stuff what and... You're gonna do. Artistic, oh, why he is doing it? You know, you read Duchamp, he, he oh. just already ask, asked all these questions. So, about silence, silence, it's like, you know, it's like water, a little bit it's similar. Silence and water. Everything is dissolved in water, and then you have solutions and micro elements dissolved in water as a substance, and then you You can hardly see those elements alone without the water, without being mixed in the water as a solution. So if, you, if you operate with chemical terms, like from chemistry. So <clears throat> silence is a bit like that. There's no, just think about it. We rarely experience silence. We actually almost never experience the silence. That's why the lockdown was such a refreshing moment, because the world was forced to be silent for a minute. I don't think the world was silent because if you didn't hear like a car uh, passing by on the street, it doesn't mean it was silent. You would hear the birds, you would hear the wind. And the person I referenced, John Cage, and his famous work, Silence. 433. 433. Um, and the book, actually, I, I also, I was lucky enough to have the book and to kind of get my, a little bit familiar my, myself familiar familiar with um, with the book um he he thought that everything is music and he, he tried to move away a little bit from the harmonic harmonic view on music he thought that not all the music is, should be a must be with harmony which is pretty incredible knowing that who was his teacher basically who he was studying with, with the master of harmony yeah the person who was like Schoenberg was is still somebody who had an incredible take on the harmony also it's interesting because when this lockdown happened I actually went to school to music school and I started to learn solfeggio you know music theory it was very interesting I've been making music for so long Like I already have album, several tracks, and I'm uh, one of the rare, I mean, it's not like I have to speak about it, it's normally that 
other people should know, notice that. But I, I think, okay, funny, we're in Paris in, in a hotel recording an interview. Kind of fits, it's a little bit ecstatic, egocentric splash, you know. And how you see yourself? At the moment, absolutely, yes. I'm not shocked. <laughs> so, yes, I'm one of these uh, rare um, examples of somebody who makes the, entirely the music, starting from the songwriting to the production arrangement, the mixing part, and then, of course, I sometimes perfect the mixing part. If I mix the songs, if I plan to release them, But with the techno tracks, and I don't, I never really mix them. I, it's all done from start to finish. And with techno, of course, it's all done. It's it's normal. But normally, like you have other people working on the music, on the text, or arrangement, or something. I combine everything. So all the music that you heard with my name, it's basically the music that I entirely made. And why am I talking about it? There was some We context. Talking about silence and how important it is. Uh, arrangement. Ah, oh, yeah, because um, I, I, I've been making music for so long, starting like from stripped down techno tracks to the actual songs, singing, performing them, and I never really... I didn't have any... No, I, I never went on any solfeggio or music theory classes, so it was like a very different experience and after actually getting a little bit like familiarizing myself with the actual music theory it was such an interesting moment for me because i i saw the entire experience from a different angle it was interesting to put my music in the form of notes on paper and to realize how mathematical this this is sometimes just using your own music as an example and understanding what actually you've done, like what kind of harmonies. And this is interesting. No, totally. And then suddenly, uh, sorry to interrupt you, no. but suddenly when I improvise, because I improvise a lot, and that's how I write music, I rarely go to the instrument, to the synthesizer and perform the music that I kind of have in mind maybe a few notes but mostly it's improvisation and sometimes I'm lucky to record the first take and on my album for example on 2012 there's a track there's a few uh, uh, songs that were recorded and what you hear on the album is actually the first take it's a fire song do you know for Ben it's like I just I, I even remember how I recorded it very well for Ben and, uh, yeah it's called for Ben four as a number and Ben was extremely in love with him. I remember. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. How, how come you remember? Outside of perspective. Remember. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was a nice time. Yeah. So I returned home after work at Propaganda Club. I, that time I already quit my dental dentist job. And I remember how I just, I was so inspired and in such a nice mood. It was already bright in the morning and I love this time of the day. Really? I love it so uh, much. It's so beautiful. This edge, you know, dusk area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like the change. Again, the counterpoint. Mm. The counterpoint, the, the change. Yeah. The juxtaposition. So polarizing element of everything. Balance. 
the chaos and then order. This, there's only order or only chaos, but what is in between, this is the most interesting part. You know, when you walk on edge and you, you always keep the tension and the tension is like ple pleasure, like the, the most uh, almost acute pleasure, the sensation that you that just makes you feel alive. Yes. You know, the moment when you're almost falling, but then you pick it up. Falling. Yes, and you stand on your feet again, and you're back to, the, to your position, in balance and in harmony. I do miss my dental practice sometimes, especially the school part. I also used to work at school, at the school as a, as a dentist, school dent dentist. I also used to work with kids, with little kids at the polyclinic, the governmental hospital for kids with teeth problems. And I have kind of even established my own system, like psychotypes, you know, like psychotypes of my patients, my little patients. But you said we're in Paris, right? Are we in uh, Paris right now? Oui. Okay. Exactement. Yeah. Je suis en Paris. And you played at the Eiffel Tower. Yes, I did. Tell me, what, what the fuck? <laughs> I want to play on the Eiffel Tower. A, what was it like? B, um, what track do you remember? Or what's like the moment that you remember from that set? For me, there, there's two, two moments. I think when I think about Eiffel Tower in Paris. You see it differently now when you walk by? Yes. I remember, for me, Paris has a few soundtracks. Let's, let's put it this way. Let's move a little bit away from the Eiffel Tower. But for me, there's like a Parisian soundtrack. So first, it's of course Malcolm McLaren, his album he, he made with, that has this party, 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 party. Ah, there you go. Dans le shaker, d'abord de l'élégance, un trait de sacré-cœur et de doigts de douaneau, une piaffe, quelques moineaux et Joséphine Baker. Mais des trois notes de jazz dans un quartier latin, un menu sur l'ardoise, au fond d'un bar tabac et la résille d'un bar sur un jeune coureur. Oh, babe. And Catherine Deneuve and oh, such a beautiful album. There is also La Vie and Rose performed by Grace Jones for me. So it was just part of a soundtrack for a show I heard today. Yeah, really? Yeah, for I think show. it was for Etam, I think. Maybe. Uh, like her version of it is just incredible. I think she did it so well. I'm still hoping to get Grace for season three as well. I met Grace one time when I used to work uh, as an artist host. I was so lucky to host her in Moscow and we went to a gay club together. That and she, amazing. She's been 
It was the same club, club where I had my parties, okay. propaganda, but they had like, I th- they actually they still have it on, on Sunday. It's been running for more than, I think for at least 20 years, the club. And on Sunday they have this gay party there and we went. Her show was I think on Saturday and on Sunday we went f- to have a good time. And I yeah. remember, I, I remember it really well. I was so, so, I mean, you have no idea. I was so, it was also a Grace album, Night Clubbing, was a connecting point for myself to, um, when I met Wally Badaru, like I told you in, in Melbourne, because <clears throat> he was an unannounced guest on the lecture part. And I carried three, no, two bags of vinyl with me to Australia and every participant had that chance to play a radio show and also to play to public. So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm bringing all my records, of course. And my records had like, always a very interesting selection from techno to some more listening music, disco. And I always like to make, mix disco with acid, you know, like juxtaposition again. Juxtaposition, juxtaposition. It's, all the, it's a tagline Contrast. I think this is like text for my totally. life. I love that. Contrast, that. juxtaposition. Yeah. Warm and, and cold, cold and warm. Hot and cold. But when you fall in love, like butterflies in your stomach, super excited, you met somebody you like. People say that I'm a fool, keeping you around. They don't say you're just no good. One day you're gonna f- fool me, put me down. But they don't know things you do to me and the way it makes me feel inside girl that i don't just keeps me girl you keeps me satisfied set it up yeah just don't know me set it up don't you <laughs> keep your fire and spreading baby you just don't know me Set it up. Don't you ever stop, babe. <laughs> Love it. And nothing will do only why to get on your mind, babe. But you tell me the reason why you got your love. Touch it all the time. You're the one that I really need. You always on my mind. Yeah. Girl, you know, you just keeps me. Girl, you keep me satisfied. Yeah, just kill no me. Da-da-da. Something like this. Omar S with Saledo. Set it out. Set it out. Set it out. Yeah, it's stuck in your head now. Set it up. And to wrap up our little chat, if your life would be a movie. What song would play in the end credits? And I, do you do you suggest uh, talking about the dying. end of life? No, no, I'm not discussing this. No, no I hate this life. topic. No, 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 no end no. of life, end of the movie. No. It could be the first part no. of the f- no. trilogy. Let's let's talk about beginning. Um, I don't know <laughs> something nice. Okay, we end no. up on a. You're the first person who denies this question. I know, I understand why people like discussing this stuff. I'm not talking so, about death. It's it's funny, I had this conversation yesterday. Death somebody. isn't attractive, no, baby. It's, not. It's, it's actually from my song, Pain in the Ass. Pain in the Ass. Oh, people. Kids are brutal, I'll tell you. They kids like, are brutal? Kids are brutal, oh. I'll tell you. They find a certain fun in taking somebody's life away.
choose five sexy tracks. <laughs> Deutsch-American Freundschaft. Küss mich als als wäre es letzte Mal. Küss mich an den Lieblings als wäre letztes Mal. Küss mich. Küss mich mit links. Drück dich an mich so fest wie du kannst. Küss mich. Liebe küsse mich. Drück dich an mich. Als wäre letztes Mal Carmen Maria Callas so sexy. This is not only sexy song, this is just ultimately the be- one of the best songs. It's not even a song in terms of in the classic meaning of it, but it's incredible, incredible piece of music. Especially when that bass came in, comes in. Phenomenon, Morris von Oswald. Oh, so, Octagon, you have to listen to it. Can we talk about your new re- release? I really liked your new music you sent me. Thank you. Did you, did you hear that song, Black, Black White? Do you know that song of mine? I play the ones. You gave me three songs. Ones. No, no, no. They, they, they all, I released it uh, many years ago. Um, actually, this is a real dialogue in between me and a, another person. It's just a called Black White. Just play it from Oct- maybe Spotify. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the world is your oyster. Oyster? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the world's your oyster. Uh, and, uh, you know, inside of oyster is pearl. No, I don't know. You don't know that? No. Yeah, inside of oyster is a pearl. Never heard of it. Do you like oysters? No. I always eat oysters when I'm old. Do you? I do. I like... I like mussels. Mussels? Mm Mm-hmm. They eat shit, you know, they they ain't no good.
Oh, that is such a beautiful I song. To, I was driving on a scooter up and down Ibiza all day long and listened to it. I, actually, this is a song where I, I literally listened to it over and over, and over again. And yeah. Oh, I actually created a new version for Tarde. Don't listen to this one. I have a new one. You want to listen? Yes. This one is without a bass and I've created a... Look at you. That was the numero thing, right? No, it was just a recent uh, um, picture. You always cut your heads. Um, <laughs> this is a new version. I kind it's of like... Awesome. Oh, your phone is so much more loud. Than it's a new phone, honey. It's so I nice. I, I just... I don't like new, I new, don't. new so things. <laughs> I'm an orthodox. Yes, everybody is blaming me for having an old iPhone, but I just, I refuse this consumption. <laughs> this is a new version. You haven't sent me that. sound is good when it's actually or almost ready when you can hear it on the old iPhone and <laughs> it will still be <laughs> okay to, yeah. to recognize the elements. Because now it's really Italo based. You like it or not? Yeah. You like it more than the other I version? I have to listen to it again. i tell you why, because I'm used to this so much now. I like the Italo element. Because it was kind of empty without. Oh, so much louder! Oh my god! <laughs> That's why I got because of I need of my own edit. And now I'm missing the new elements. I'm like ah. Oh. You only added the baseline. And some no, more, more keys, more elements. But this, your vocals are more present. They're, they're more in front. Yes. You like it? Like this? Okay, I will add it. It's I like this too. I like it too. I think it was because of the half of the half. Sure. Sure, I'll Yeah. Okay, I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you, my, my first got from phones. Great edit, great. I love the Italo for sure. What makes this so special for me is because your vocals are in front, okay, it's I'm not the production. Because what I love about it is that, send me something, send me me. That is the, for me, that's Okay, well, I will do the mix a bit louder. To yeah. Because here, the production, the sound, the music is taking over again. Yeah. And, and your vocals can become the second. Better. This is the other way around. Actually, also one of the sexiest songs is Venus as a Boy, Bjork.
Abba Lay All Your Love On Me Extremely sexy song Brennigan's edit of rough song uh, self control. You take myself, you take my self control. Did you know that it's an Italian song? Rough. By rough, and she did a cover version. Why I live for you, creatures of the night. Of course, of course, my God, Led Zeppelin, a lot of love, of course. A lot of love, ooh, a lot of love, ooh. Oh, I'm survival, baby, I want to be a backdoor man. I want to give you my love. A lot of love, ooh, a lot of love, ooh. Up and down. Of course, Doors, Doors, the sexiest song. When is over, turn of the light, turn of the light. When the music's over here. When the music's over, turn up the light. So many songs, honestly. Nice. So I just don't, I don't even know which direction to go. Don't go any direction, whatever comes to your mind first. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm actually doing, exactly what I'm doing. I'm actually, you know what, what's happening? I'm, rem I'm picturing my room with my record shelves. That's what Bradley Zero did. He was like, I can't. So he just pulled any record out of his record shelf while I interviewed him. Shout out to our friend Bradley Zero. What's up, baby boy? But I think we should wrap it up with Grace Jones nightclubbing. I think that's so fitting to you. Especially in that hoodie. Your long vent. You got it last night? That's why you're still wearing it? Actually, the moment when I when we went to that club, I asked her some question. She was also kind of, you know, she had a concert. She was, she should have been tired. But she was not. She was oozing that energy. The life, you know, it's very... I'm actually reading her book now, and it's about Paris. Her mm -hmm. Paris day is as well. Mm -hmm. How she arrived yeah, here. Messy. How she... Um, met Isimiyaki. As I asked her some question and she goes, she was in a hoodie, arty hoodie. She says, she answered, always baby, always. So when I want to answer somebody, something that I'm very sure about, I always remember what she said. Always baby, 
Always. Nina Kravitz, спасибо. Пожалуйста. Я тебя люблю, давай. Пока. Я тебя тоже люблю. Пока. Спасибо, что пригласил для этого замечательного разговора в Париже. За чашечкой чая. И вино. И вина для кого-то. Для меня это только чай, а для тебя это полноценный полноценные как же это сказать там Thank you for tuning in this week. If you want to listen to the full playlist, visit areonair.com or our Spotify channel. You can also find us on Instagram and on YouTube at areonair. And a big thank you to my wonderful team at Studio Noi. I'm Armand Nafei and I'll speak to you soon.